empowered. Wonderful. Thank you all for joining us. More people will be dropping in, I am sure. And um, I'm so grateful to have Pam McPherson with us this evening. And I appreciate people. Normally we do this on Thursday evenings. And I am just uh, so grateful that people are coming on a Wednesday evening. I know that's not normally what we do. But uh, my name is Susan Barber and I am managing the community education events here for the Elizabeth Kubler Ross Foundation. And I just wanna say a little bit about the Elizabeth Kubler Ross Foundation. We're a 501c3, a not-for-profit organization that, uh, so Elizabeth's work has been carried on by her son, Ken, and a number of other people who are inspired by the life of psychiatrist, humanitarian, and hospice pioneer, Dr. Elizabeth Kubler-Ross. The foundation began just one year after Elizabeth's death by Ken, her son, and over the course of the last 15, maybe 16 years, the foundation chapters have been created on four continents to continue her mission to develop hospice palliative care and grief support. In 2019, most of Elizabeth's archives were donated to Stanford University, which will create a digital library to make her papers available to the public online. I wanna also just say that one of the things that was most important to Elizabeth was the belief that uh, unconditional love is one of the most healing medicines there is. And in that spirit, we continue her work by offering uh, free, events for the public, and that is what we're doing tonight. I also want to introduce you to Pam McPherson. Pam has spent a lifetime working in end-of-life care and supporting people who are dying and their loved ones, and this book that she's sharing with us tonight is a result of that. She has um, spent many, many hours at the bedside of people in the last days, hours, and minutes of their life, and that is uh, come to life in the collection of poetry that she's entitled Vigil, the Poetry of Presence. She shares how late at night in the moments of quiet intimacy, simply by being a compassionate witness, one can bring comfort and healing to those most in need. And I'm just so grateful to Pam for her willingness to share this time with us. And I am going to move you down, Pam, to the spotlight here, and I am going to remove myself from here. So thank you so much. And please just go ahead and begin in any way that you would like to, or if you would like to say another introduction, or Ken Ross, who is here anonymously, if you would just like to say a couple of words. I know that your mom and Pam were great friends and that you have known Pam for many, many years. Thank you, Susan. It's a pleasure to be here. Um, I'm going to say quietly in the background, but I just want to greet Pam. Pam and I go back about 19 years or so. Uh, Pam showed up in my life. She was working on a project called The Pioneers of Hospice, a video on uh, four of the many pioneers of hospice, but she picked four central characters, uh, Dame Cicely Saunders, Florence Wald, Balfour <laughs> Mount, and Elizabeth Kubler-Ross. So I was her uh, intermediary and uh, ushered Pam into my mom and my life. Uh, and she got to visit with my mom, I think the last two years of her life and came out a number of times and became a great friend. We just clicked on many levels and Pam's been uh, with me on the entire journey of the foundation. So uh, she's been uh, shepherding me and <laughs> holding me steady sometimes when I begin to wobble. Uh, she's got a lot more experience than I do, um, but uh, it's been a lovely friendship and she's been a lovely voice of uh, reason and uh, <laughs> knowledge and friendship during these last 19 years. and. It's been an honor and privilege to have her as my friend, and we don't get to visit each other enough, but we try to do what we can, and uh, hopefully there's a few more projects together uh, between us out in the future. So we're working on one or two things quietly. But uh, anyway, I'd like to thank Pam for being here, and I'd like to thank all of you for spending part of your evening with us. The foundation's been uh, up and roaring for about 16 years now since my mom died, and uh, we have a lot of exciting projects coming, including a feature movie. So I will turn it back over to Pam, and hopefully you'll be able to see our project, The Pioneers of Hospice, uh, somewhere online one of these days soon. It's temporarily off the market. I'll give it to you, Pam. Thank you very much. Thank you, Pam. Oh, Pam begins. Pam. I, just Sorry? Want, I just want to invite people, as um, Parul has done in the chat, to put in where you are Zooming in from. One of the wonderful things about the foundation is there's people from all over the world that come into these meetings and it's wonderful to see where you all are from. Thank you so much, Monica, Parul, and Pam, please go ahead. 
Oh, thanks, Susan. And thank you, Ken, my dear friend. Um, I, I need to say that um, the work that Ken was talking about that I was involved with was with a team of people called the Madison Dean Initiative. And I was a member of that team. And as a team, some of us had the honor and the privilege to spend time with Elizabeth. And um, it's, it just is uh, one of my most special memories is uh, some of the things that we did with her, but that's for another, another uh, show. <laughs> Tonight, we're here to talk about uh, my book, video, uh, video. That's for another video I was gonna say. Um, we're here to talk about my book, um, Vigil, the Poetry of Presence. And um, I have uh, been a hospice volunteer since 1985. And for 16 years, I was the co-coordinator of the hospice uh, volunteer program um, here in Burlington, Vermont, where I live. And um, my passion during that ho whole span of time, I, when I discovered it, it was amazing because it's been a strong thread through the rest of my life. And I'm still a hospice volunteer. I retired in 2004, um, just had my 80th birthday. And um, I'm still going strong, fortunately. So um, end of life care is really, really what touches the deepest part of my heart. I, I just would like to jump in and read a poem to start with. And, um, and then we'll um, see what the flow is as we go along. Uh, if you have any concerns or interests or things that you would like us, Susan or I, to know um, about the process we're going through here, reading anything that you would let request, um, please feel free to use the chat box. Soul friend. In a peaceful, still, lowly lit room lies a gentle man, a stranger to me, who has by choice had the ventilator that assisted his trached breathing removed, an act of both courage and sensibility. He now rests tranquilly away from intensive care in a private room, having accepted and now allowing the natural, gradual, slow release of worn out and challenged basic life-holding body systems. Presence is what I offer, unconditional acceptance, deep respect, compassionate caring. Our unspoken connection rises from the heart. Within moments, as I settle in next to him, he becomes a soul friend. I feel like the privilege of being able to sit with people when they're dying at whatever stage they're at um, is, it's just an extreme privilege to be able to do that, to bear witness to a time of such great mystery and um, importance. Um, and I am one, only one, you know, in reading the poems from my book, I can assure you that the sentiments that I express and um, the experiences that I've had that have, have uh, caused me to write these poems um, are, are similar experiences and feelings that are shared by hundreds and hundreds of volunteers across the world, really, um, who do this same thing. So I, I am one of many. Um, years ago, uh, well, we were talking at the dinner table about this tonight. I think it was seven years ago, um, I was going to be on a panel for our hospice program with uh, four or five other volunteers who were going to be uh, speaking about vigil sitting for a volunteer, hospice volunteer audience. And I was trying to think what I could do, what I would have to say, especially if I was the last one to speak, um, what I would have to say that would be any different from any of the others. So when I went through my, look through my hospice journal that I keep and I treasure, um, I realized how much poetry there was in there. So I brought a couple of poems to lunch the next day with a couple of my Madison Dean Initiative friends and asked if I could read them poems to see if they thought a poem would be appropriate. I read them one poem. These are 
two very dear friends who are as passionate as I am about end of life care. And um, I read one poem to them and they sat there and they didn't respond. And I thought, oh, that went down the tubes. Um, and I thought that inside myself. And then I said to them, would you be willing to listen to another? And they said, absolutely. <laughs> so I read them another poem and they said to me, you, what they said was you need to do something with this. So that was really the genesis of this book coming into be. I've never published anything before. I've never been public about my poetry. Um, and um, so that just gives you a little bit of a background. Uh, I am like many of you, a person who's just willing to be with um, someone who is dying, who's comfortable doing that and willing to support in that way. The next poem I'm gonna read you is um, called Hallowed Hallway. And uh, my volunteering at the bedside has been both in the hospital and in um, people's homes or um, an end of life, uh, beautiful end of life residence that we have here that people can, can um, be residents in. Um, this particular poem is uh, about me going to the hospital in the evening. The evening is the time that I most frequently volunteer um, anytime between supper time and, and midnight or one in the morning. It's the time that I generally choose a block of time when they're offered to, um, to participate. Hallowed Holloway, a name sounding vaguely familiar and a room number but he's being transferred, I'm told. What new experience awaits me in the sacred territory of dying? As I enter the hospital, moving through long winding hallways, faces pass me, concerned loved ones easily identified. Other countenances with focused expressions hurry on to their next destination. Oh, hallowed hallways and rabbit warren chambers, you bear witness to days and nights of joy and sorrow, fears of diagnosis, apprehension for treatment, families sitting vigil with dying loved ones, all intervals of uncertainty, while above on the next floor, a joyful new life begins. This medical center, one vast vessel holding the fullness of life, balancing beginnings and endings, and all the challenges of health-filled existence in the moments, days, months, and years that lie in between. As I said, generally, I, um, my volunteering time is often in the evening, but the next poem I'm gonna read you um, takes place in the daytime, and this particular poem is um, experiences in the hospital. Um, I was a part of a program that doesn't exist here anymore. It does in other places, um, but um, a program that I was very committed to called No One Dies Alone. And um, it was started years ago by a nurse out, I think it was in Oregon, um, who uh, worked in intensive care and had an elderly gentleman who asked her if she would sit with him, he was dying. And she said she would, but that she had to just check on her other patients and then she would be back to sit with him. And as you can guess, when she returned, he had died. Um, this haunted her for years. And finally she met the right person, one of the people in the spiritual department at the hospital. And the conversation happened again about that experience and together they created this this national program called No One Dies Alone. Volunteers who sit at the bedside in the hospital or nursing homes. This particular day, I was going in in the afternoon and um, all the only information I had that I even usually would have is the name of the person I was going to be sitting with, the times I would be there and their room number. So that was a that was a learning process for me, having been a hospice volunteer coordinator for years, having prided myself on giving 
volunteers a lot of information, as much information as was appropriate and helpful um, to help to guarantee the success of their placement in a hospice assignment. So to transition to um, such anonymity was a real place for a lot of personal growth on my part and to learn to just be with what is, see what one finds. So it causes me and others to, when I arrive at a room to, you know, when I'm sitting quietly in the room to look for clues and to know who this person is. Because most of the people that I sit with in the last um, 72, 48 or 24 hours of life are um, very somnolent, um, either through natural processes or uh, medication and uh, hopefully in a very peaceful place. In this instance, a brother came in while I was there. So I'll just read the poem. Work boots tell a story. Angular, narrow, mustached face. Rhythmical breathing of a medicated body that six days ago was up and fighting to go home. Heavy black work boots stand motionless in the corner. One holds a brace to minimize a limp that along with years of unrelenting hip pain echoed the ramifications of a teenage car accident. All aspects of life were interfered with, inhibited by, and diminished by the dark shadows of challenged health. With me, a gentle, loving brother sits across the bed and shares soft-spoken stories of his brother's love of fishing, a man whose physical limitations made him sit in a chair, stream aside, limited his ability to have regular, meaningful work, cast a dark shadow on his potential. This man drew the short straw in life, yet in the eyes of his accomplished brother, he is loved, appreciated and valued for what's inside. Remnants of a childhood, evidence of family values, their mom and dad would be proud. It was such a treat um, to sit and hear the stories at the bedside that so often I, I just don't get to hear. Um, because I, I've been a journaler for years, um, often randomly, uh, not, um, I go through periods of time when I journal regularly and others where, where I don't. Um, but I thought I would show you a page from my journal, um, the particular page um, uh, that has this poem on it. Um, I always bring my journal with me in my bag when I sit with someone and occasionally I take it out because something comes to me, a thought comes to me, and I wanna jot it down um, so that I can go back to it and explore it further um, later. Or sometimes that one thing I jot down just becomes the first line of a poem and the pen keeps going and when it stops, I'm done. Um, these poems are all un unedited. They're directly from my personal journal and they're my way of processing the experiences that I have in sitting um, sit, it, sitting with people who are dying, it, it, it's one of the ways that I take care of myself is writing. So this is a photo of the um, of the page in the journal. I actually drew a little sketch of his his boot. I did this afterward, um, but that's what this particular page in my journal looks like they aren't always as artsy as that particular one and sometimes they are. Um, whatever whatever moves me in the moment, but um, I just thought I might share that with you. The next poem I'd like to read for you, um, and Susan, please feel free to participate with me or um, jump in and ask me if there's something you'd like me to expand on or, um, or you hear about a question that someone has anytime. So this poem, um, in some of these experiences that I've had, um, 
I have a, a moment of um, recollection or a, a some kind of a connection from my past life that um, catches me off guard. And um, in this particular poem, I hadn't thought about this person for years, but um, I generally sit next, very close to the person that I'm sitting with. I bring my chair bedside and sit, sit very close. Sometimes I put my hand on their arm. I always speak to them softly when I come in and tell them my name and then I'll be sitting next to them. Um, in this particular case, when I sat down and I touched this person's hand, I said to them, I'm just going to hold your hand. And that's, that's the title of this poem and I'll tell you a little more after. I'm just going to hold your hand. I'm just going to hold your hand. How many times have I said that? Offering to sit silently, to just be there. You may sleep. I'm just going to hold your hand, said high school freshman Benny, as we sat awkwardly silent on the living room couch. Him, a secret intruder, after two-year-old Colleen, whom I was babysitting, had gone to sleep for the night. This, the timid, tongue-tied silence of my first dating experience. Now those words glide over my lips so easily, always spoken from my heart. They are permission, a promise of presence, focused attendance in bearing witness. And while silence is golden, I am now neither tongue-tied nor timid about opening my heart to these precious, sacred moments shared with another. The backstory to this is that um, when I was a teenager and was babysitting for 50 cents an hour, um, I was babysitting for my cousin this evening and one of my parents' rules about my babysitting was that uh, no friends were ever allowed to be there. And um, I had always respected that. This particular evening, I, my aunt and uncle, who I adored, always, <clears throat> excuse me, always um, had um, seven up there for me and onion soup dip to dip potato chips in, treats that I didn't get at home. And um, so I was just sitting there dipping my chips and sipping my seven up. Um, when someone knocked at the door. And I, of course, wasn't expecting anyone. And I got up and went to the door. And when I looked, um, there stood Benny. He was a year older than me. We were in high school. I think I was a freshman. And um, he had come to see me. And I could see my mother's face and I could hear my father's voice. And I said, come in. Um, caught off guard completely by my willingness to do that. Um, so Benny came in and we sat on the couch and he was a kind of a gentle, timid fellow, very nice fellow. And um, we sat on the couch and I got him some seven up and we dipped our chips. We talked a little bit and then there wasn't anything else to say. Um, so we sat there in silence, uncomfortable silence, until he finally reached over and he just said to me, I'm just going to hold your hand. So we held hands and after some more uncomfortable silence, he said, I think I need to go now. And he got up and I saw him to the door and he left. I hadn't thought about that experience in probably 50 years. And when I said it that one time, um, it just, um, Benny just came right to life for me. It was just such an incredible experience. And I, you know, I've told this story and read this poem so many times in my readings because I love it. Um, and a, one of the participants in my readings, I received a little package in the mail for her from her afterward. And look what it was. Lipton's onion soup mix to make the dip. 
very, very, very 1950s. The next poem I'm going to read to you um, was uh, from a visit that I made at um, what our, our respite house here, a beautiful, beautiful home that um, was, has been in existence for 30 years now, uh, where people can be when they need a place beyond their own home to be um, for end of life care. It's very much a home atmosphere. And um, the people in this uh, residence are served and cared for by the hospice team. This particular instance, I was asked um, to go because I had done some recording of um, patients' stories um, to preserve them. And um, so I think I'll just, I think I'll just jump into the poem. I think the poem just tells the whole story. Is it time? Is it time? His eyes close and he wonders, weakened voice, deep, painful cough. He returns from a brief semi-awake moment to the shallow sleep that permeates his current status. Five days ago, such a short time and yet a rich, deep time in our new relationship. A request came to me from the hospice volunteer office, a volunteer to preserve his story. Time is short. He's a great storyteller, and indeed he was. Only four daily visits, and each day on my late afternoon arrival, I am warned by his family. He's had a bad day. He slept most of the day. His family leaves the room as we had agreed, and I arrange my chair next to his bed. Prepare my voice recorder and gently touching his shoulder, I say his name. His eyes open and honestly have a twinkle. He softly greets me, knowing my mission. I ask if he'd like to do more reminiscing with me. With a positive nod, I clip the tiny microphone on him and say, tell me about your mother and we're off. So it was for four visits. My concern about tiring him was met with denial. I remember her kitchen, the story begins, and stretches to an older brother, my protector when I was bullied at school. Each day brings forth remembered times full of richness and detail. Parents, grandparents, and siblings are all described and woven into tales of childhood adventures and parochial school days. My wife, she's the best thing that ever happened to me, he tenderly shares. Pride in their children's accomplishments extend down through young adult grandchildren. Photos come out, more stories flow, and his saddest admission is shared. I never told my children I loved them enough. I'm learning to do it now, his voice trails off emotionally. It's so hard to leave them. The fifth day, with the same arrival status shared, I settle in, touch his shoulder and say his name. But it was different. Shall we try, I ask? He opens his eyes, nods, and then dozes off again. There was to be no more. While I had captured over five hours, his storytelling was done. I sat with him, held his hand. And one time when he awoke, he asked me if it was time. I said the time was getting closer. I assured him that there was time. Time for him to receive more love from his family. Time for him to lean into peaceful sleep. Someone will always be with you, I promised. I thanked him for his gift of friendship and promised him the stories he shared with me will be preserved for his family. This is another way you'll be present with them, I promised. As in the bountiful tomorrows, they lovingly hold his gentle spirit with them. 
forevermore. That was such a special assignment. Um, and I did it really not realizing the time that it would require me to, to um, type up the five hours of stories he had told me. But I did that and I also put his voice on a CD for them and made copies for the family and gave it to them um, following his uh, funeral service. It was a one, just thinking of him right now is a wonderful memory. And one of the things that I think about being with people in the hours and moments before they die is a time takes on a very different quality and sort of in our lives away from the bedside, we're rushing, we have so much to do. And, you know, the sense of time just slowing down of just being completely present in the moment that's happening is one of the great gifts, at least for me, it's been a great gift of being just with one person, just with their story, just out of my own head. And, and these are some of the things that you're conveying just so beautifully. And well, thank if, you. Go ahead. Somebody saying here, thank you for being our voice, hospice workers <laughs> that work in hospice. Thank you for giving voice to some of these things that mm. people, you know, when we talk about working in hospice, if you want to clear a room quickly, when somebody asks you, what kind of work do you do? You say, oh, mm. I work with people who are dying. Most of the time, that is a room clearer. Mm. And yet, <laughs> for people that do this work, it's hard. I think it's very hard to articulate just the beautiful experience that this can be accompanying somebody right up to the threshold, um, right up to that mystery. This is a mysterious experience, our life. And I think there's no time that makes that more clear. Maybe birth, I have only been to the birth of a small tiny cow, um, but uh, you know, death certainly there's just, it's an otherworldly experience, the times that I've been with somebody when they're taking their last breath. And I think these poems just express that so beautifully. Uh, thanks, Susan. Um, yeah, you know, everything that you said is so true. Thank you for saying those things. And it, it's good to bring me um, back to um, one of the really most important things that I wanna talk about, and that is about being present. Mm -hmm. The um, value, the gift, and what it is uh, being present. Um, because, um, I mean, that is, that's the title of this book. It's how important that word is to me, um, the poetry of presence. Um, being, being with someone and just being, not doing. We are, we, are, we humans are, are doing people and not as good at, at being, being people. Um, when I, I love to share how I, how I arrive at an assignment, um, when I, uh, accept, uh, and often we're tag teaming, there are other volunteers that are filling in with me. We are each taking a, a clump of time to sit with someone. Um, uh, when I head out to my assignment, be it at the hospital or in someone's home respite house or wherever I'm um, toning myself down I'm trying to let go of my day and um, and just bring myself into a place of calm and peace and when I arrive when I go through the door the, the portal to their space where they are and I'm in my head I'm imagining myself in the hospital having gone through the long corridors and everything when I get to the door I just pause for a second and when I go through that door I make a commitment to leave what anything that's about me outside the room my day um the things that have been on my mind what my kids are up to what I'm doing tomorrow outside the room and I enter the room to just be to to be fully present to what I find when I get in there, to give it my, to be alert, to give it my full attention. Um, and while much of the time that I'm sitting vigil with someone is silent time, um, it's very tranquil. Sometimes I do speak, sometimes I 
if a person is responsive or um, or restless, or if I want to respond to something that's going on for them, um, I often will say, um, uh, I'm blocking the word I want right now, but uh, phrases that that aren't empowering, but that are reassuring, uh, like you're you're doing important work right now. I'm honored to just sit at your side and be here for you. Um, or I hope that you feel all of the love that's around you as you're entering this important passageway in your life, that sort of thing. Um, but much of the time is silent. But re what's really important is about, for me, is about being fully present. And when I'm fully present, there's things for me to learn. There are always things for me to learn. I never know what they're going to be, but um, I just want to be open just to, to recognize and um, see what they are. Um, and truthfully, just in being fully present holds its own lessons because that is, it's such a, a wonderful self-care act um, as well as a respectful um, being present to whomever to whomever you're with. Do you want to add to that, Susan? You know, when you're, I was just listening to you, Pam, and it was reminding me of something I would, uh, when I was doing volunteer training, which I did for 22 years, um, I would talk to the volunteers about um, hand washing before they go to see the patient in the house, if they're going to the house or in a facility, um, to really wash their hands and to use that not just as a sort of uh, cleanly, like really just to become completely clean to so you're not bringing anything literally into your patient, but to really use that time to just literally wash away anything that's going on in your own life at that moment. And the reason I feel like that's so important is many years ago, I was at a Stephen Levine workshop and mm -hmm. Stephen had recommended uh, that I do some standing meditation because I found myself falling asleep when I was sitting. And I did that the next morning and not to, it's just, I ended up going face down right onto the floor. I didn't even put my hands out. I was aware of this whole experience. And then I was face down on the floor. And as I started to come to, I just was aware of an incredible amount of fear in the room. And then the next thought was this fear is directed at me. And then I was like, oh, why do I have the rug in my mouth? And look at what am I, what's just happened here. But that experience of so many people in the room, of course, as my friend who was with me said, it sounded like 4,000 pounds of bricks being dropped through the roof. So it did make everybody feel a little weird, but it became profoundly, um, became a profound experience because I feel like when we go in to see patients, they are so attuned. It's almost like they turn down the volume of what we're saying and they're just on this other wavelength of the feeling state that we're bringing in. So to go in as fully present as possible, to let go of the other things that are happening in our lives and to find a way to really make that transition either through the hand washing or for some people they'd say you know, a mantra or they'd say a poem or they would say a song. They do something that would really bring them to the present moment. And as you said, being present with somebody, being present with anybody at any time is such an incredible gift for the person that we're present with and for ourselves. But I think it's amplified at end of life when that feeling state that we are bringing to the bedside is amplified because they're just in this other kind of space. So mm -hmm. very um, true. And as somebody just said here, you're, you've, you've put words to this experience in such a beautiful and dignified way that they just really, just really appreciate that. And Thank silence you. is great eloquence. Yes, Richard, that's absolutely for sure true. Thank you. Um, yes, that's so true. And you know, Susan, I have come to realize, uh, I, I give full credit um, to the people who are dying. I think that they're my teachers. Oh, sure. um, I think that for me, um, the privilege of, of bearing witness um, during this important transition in their life um, um, is a teaching moment for me. And I, my job is to keep my heart open and my self open to what I'm supposed to learn. Um, yeah, 
it's really, it's, it's amazing. It's, it's, I mean, I'm just so fortunate that I'm allowed to do this. I completely agree. You know, one thing is also coming to mind was this, um, we would do these things at Stephen's workshop about halfway through, he'd have like people, one person lay down on the ground, the other person sit next to them and just make the ah sound every time there was an exhale. And it seems like such a simple exercise. We do that for two minutes and then people would switch. The person that was observing the breathing would go down on the ground. And there were so many times where people came up just sobbing and they said, mm -hmm. this is incredible. My wife and I have been married for 20 years, but I don't think either of us have paid just that kind of attention to each other in such an unfiltered and just such a holistic way. And it, it really made me understand that being completely present to another person and loving another person, that I don't know that there's much difference in that. The felt experience when somebody can just be with you um, to the point that they're noticing your breathing and they're just noticing everything that's happening with you is just such a loving expression for that person. And for me, if people can die feeling loved, I think that that is just a remarkable gift to offer to someone. And vigiling is just a, such a distillation of that concept. Awesome. Um, yeah, very, uh, very true. Very, very true. Thank you, Susan. Um, I'm going to read the next poem. I was going to skip over to get to the one that really relates to what we were just saying, but I like this poem, so I'm going to go with, with it, and then we'll go to the next one. Um, this poem is called Birth Love, and this, again, was a hospital experience that I had, and um, I, would, I would define this as a situation where it felt like life wasn't fair. Birth love, flashing through the windows, passing car light beams glisten on the rain slick street, a reminder of life as usual, while one small frail woman sleeps the gentle sleep of a morphine drip. A motionless body winding down, her corporal mechanisms overworked, worn out, challenged by alcohol to the point of failure. 55 mortal years closing in, preparing to release a spirit for whom I sense life was not fair. May she have felt loved. May some of her wishes have come true. May she have laughed heartily and been embraced when overcome with sadness and tears. In this moment, I will hold her parents' love for her on the day she was born, returning it to her through my compassionate presence as I witness her final hours and moments in this universe that is all that we know. The next poem I'd like to read is called Still Point. This is a favorite of mine. And um, the quote that comes to mind whenever I read this is one by Sogyal Rinpoche, who wrote the Tibetan uh, book of living and dying. And that is, death is a mirror in which the entire meaning of life is reflected. Great quote. Still point is what it's about for me as a volunteer, um, about providing a caring presence, making a difference and opening my heart to being. Still point. Me, a stranger at your bedside, your hand held in mine as in this still dimly lit space that is your hospital room, I breathe with you, matching my breath to your shallow fading air exchange. How could I know what I was about to receive? Your presence, your dying brings me to my still point, the place of centering and calm so difficult to access in the hum and buzz of everyday living, a place where nothing exists beyond our sacred shared presence. 
to not die alone, to bear witness to this sacred transition, to stand in for all who ever loved you is a privilege beyond description. Spirit, be free. Fly in the space of complete peace and be held in the all accompanying embrace of all loving ancestors. Ancestors come up a lot for me when I'm sitting vigil or writing about my experiences of sitting vigil. Um, often uh, just awareness of my own ancestors accompanies uh, doing this, which for me, I think is another form of afterlife. It's, it's really nice to have them come into my head and think that maybe we have some connection. The poem that I always like to accompany this particular reading, and I, I love this still point poem because it there are so few places in our lives, like Susan was just talking about, where we can be in that place of being so still and being calm and centered. Um, uh, our car radios are going, our cell phones are buzzing, our, our minds are busy with the things we've just done, the things we haven't done yet that maybe should have done and the things we have yet to do. Um, we live in a, a great existence of doing. So finding, having an experience that allows us to be in our still point is, um, is a great gift. So this poem, um, actually when my book was published, I told, we have three adult kids, and um, my husband, of course, knew about it, and our, our kids knew about it. They were excited for me that it was happening. And um, the books arrived on my front uh, front steps the day the books arrived on my front steps. The two boxes of books just felt almost like giving birth to me. It was like, it was so exciting to open, bring a box in and open it and take out the first copy and hold it in my hands. and just see the finished product. I was so proud and so elated and just so happy. Um, I didn't tell the kids the books had arrived. I quickly took out three books and, and inscribed them to each of them and immediately put them in the mail to them to let them receive one um, as a surprise. And when my our youngest son, Andrew, received his, I got a message from him that said I'm at work I, I can't read the book right now but I just got it and I'm so excited and I looked at just the beginning of it and I can't wait to get back to it tonight so that night I was just climbing into bed and it was around 10 30 and um ready to turn out the light when my cell phone was on the bedside stand and um uh there was a text message on it and I you know, had that dilemma that most of us have. Do I re do I look at it and see it or do I just let it wait until morning? And of course, just like Benny, I said, when I said, come in, um, I looked at it and it was from Andrew. And he said, it simply said, mom, I've read the um, preface to your book. I've read some of the poems and there's one poem. He said, I have read it three times. I even read it out loud to myself. Would you read it to me? And I was like, Andrew, I just got into bed. And of course, of course I would. So we got on the phone. Um, I got out of bed, got my, a copy of my book, climbed back in again. And he was in bed with his book. And um, I read the poem to him. Um, and, we and we talked about it. And then of course it was, let, let's read another one. Tell me what page before you start to read mom. <laughs> and I think we were awake doing this until about one in the morning. It was just an amazingly wonderful time together. But this is the poem that um, just stopped him. The title of the poem is Whose Son Is This? It has nothing to do with Andrew. <laughs> um, Whose Son Is This? 
Whose son is this? Whose innocent babe grown homeless? What path divided at perhaps a critical time, mental illness guiding his itinerary through troubled decades, a schizophrenic burden his to carry. As I hold his hand, reading my book about silence, his breathing stops ever so quietly. This gentle, soundless exit is truly the ultimate silence. Bearing witness, I lean in and softly say, go, go to your mother. She awaits you, her child who's had such a difficult life. Fly spirit, you are now free. And as I sit there, I wonder, is his spirit soul gone? I see his shell, feel the slowly creeping in coldness. Silence of spirit, now of body. Silence, for him, freedom. I love that poem. I can relive that moment. And in fact, most of my poems, when I read them, I'm still picturing the person that I was with um, that caused the poem to be written. One of the things I would say, well, a couple of things I would say um, following this poem is it's very rare that someone dies when I'm there. I am sitting with them for a two or three or four hour period of time, um, but that's a speck of time in their extended time of dying. Um, however, sometimes it does happen when I'm there and I personally just see it as such a sacred, sacred moment to just hold, to just be with. In the hospital, when this has happened, I actually have come to a place where I don't go right out and get the nurse and say, you know, Joe Blow has just died. Um, I sit with them. Sometimes I hum a song. Um, sometimes I say affirmative things and sometimes I'm just silent, honoring and witnessing the mystery of whatever has just transpired. I always note the time if I'm in the hospital that the death occurred and in five minutes or 10 minutes, I go out and get the nurse and tell them because I know that once I do that, I set a whole other set of wheels in motion. The lights in the room go on, someone comes in to pronounce the person, you know, the family is called, the, the internal resident comes by, um, a whole process begins. And I just wanna hold on to that sacred moment um, as I'm able to. In, in hospice, death is not an emergency. Death is an expected outcome. It's a natural, part an organic part of living is our birthing and our dying they are natural normal aspects of our existence you want to comment susan or shall i go uh, one thing i started doing and i don't even remember the first time this happened i think it happened Probably with Bob, my, my probably, he was, I would say, soulmate guy. And I just told him right after he died that he had died in case he was in any kind of confusion about what was happening. Because I had worked for a long time with a young man who had been in a coma. And he said it took him, he couldn't figure out because he had been in this coma for about six months. But he said, you know, it was like I was aware of kind of what was going on. And it's like a dream you have when you're trying to communicate with people around you, but they can't hear you. And like when Gabe was telling us we were in a support group and Gabe was one of the members, it just it made sense that if somebody's been really ill, that they may not have an idea like, did I die or am I in a coma or what's going on? So I've been telling people for the last 30 years, if I'm with them when they die, that they've died. 
that we will take care of everything here, that they should just keep going to wherever they're going mm -hmm. and to thank them for that opportunity to be with them at that time. And as I will tell people, I have no idea if that is useful or helpful to them, um, but it does make me feel better that if there's any mm -hmm. confusion in those moments that they understand what's happening. And so, yeah, I don't like to go and get the nurse or call the hospice or any of those things because then that's, that's a whole bunch more activity right away. Mm -hmm. and so to give a little bit of time uh, for that person to just whatever is happening to let that settle in. So yes, yeah, so I really mm -hmm. appreciate what you just said. Yeah, thank you for that. Um, giving that reassurance, uh, I think to do that ahead of time and giving permission for people to let go. Um, but I never thought to do it afterwards. I like that. Thank you. Um, actually, I'm going to jump to another poem that for me was, um, let's see, oh, here it is, was a new experience um, and it was challenging. This particular situation happened in the hospital and this is not a poem that's in my book. I do have some others that I have written since I published the book and I truthfully don't have a plan to republish, but um, I love to share some of these. And this particular situation was um, uh, an elderly gentleman dying in the hospital who was not responsive. And his family had not been present to him. Um, he had actually been receiving care at a, a local social service um, uh, place in Burlington. And the title of the poem is Found Down. And I used that title because I had never, I had never heard that expression before. But found down means exactly what the words say. It's when they find someone who is keeled over would be another substitute for that title. Um, and uh, don't know what has happened. They are just found in the moment. And that's what happened with this gentleman. And he had some wonderful social workers that were working with him that really cared about him. And, um, came to the hospital during the late evening when I was there um, to be with him, which was very special. But some family members showed up too in a, a disconcerting, um, uncomfortable way for me. So I could just go ahead and share it with you. Found down a hospice, uh, I'm sorry, a house doctor was alerted to their arrival. A young woman and two girlfriends flew in on a cloud of energy, the source of which I am uncertain. Spirited, noisy, smoke smelling. She shook her dad, wanted him to wake up or die. Hoped he would respond, hated the in-between, the process in dying. They paced, asked questions, were balancing uncertainty and fear with obligation. But why? What's that? Why is he making that sound? They took photos, took his pulse, asked questions. The hospitalist doctor was very helpful to them. A priest came and gave the last rites. The girls abruptly left holding their shoulds and can'ts and all was peaceful again. It's just an unusual situation for me to be in as a volunteer. And um, I just stood in the background. The nursing staff had had a call from this daughter who wanted to come to visit her father. And because the social workers knew the family situation, they alerted the hospitalist physician in the hospital uh, to be present when they came, which was almost immediately. Um, so it was a very, um, it was a new experience for me. I, my role was to stay in the background, which I did completely. Uh, the space was theirs and the physician was very, very good in handling the situation. And that's one other thing that I would like to speak about. Being present is, a, is one of my main thing, themes 
And the other is another is about holding space, being able to make a space feel safe for people where they feel like they can trust and they feel safe with whatever it is they're dealing with. Now, whether that's us with a friend out having a cup of coffee, a friend who's bearing their soul to us about something, or a family member who's distraught um, about something that's occurred, or it's a situation like this was in the hospital. Um, holding space, when we hold space for someone, we hold, um, we, we make the space safe for them. We cause them to feel that the space is safe, that they can trust us, that we will give them our full attention. It is not about solving their dilemmas or problems. It's not about having the answers, but it's, there's no fixing. There's no judgment and no changing the situation. It's an acceptance of the situation as it is and just witnessing and validating what the other person is experiencing. And I think in this poem, in this situation, I feel that this hospital physician did that for these daughters. He was present to them. He allowed them to do what they needed to do to be who they were and, and kept the space safe, not just for them, but for the, the patient too, and for the rest of us in the room. Um, but it's, it's, uh, it's a huge gift that we can give when we can hold space with and for someone else. Let it just be about them. And we are not there to fix it um, or even to make it better, except that our presence and our understanding, our, our um, compassion um, may make that moment better for them. And our just being so present to them too may also um, give them um, the space to discover what their next steps might be or to resolve, begin to resolve whatever is going on. It's a huge gift. I'm going to read you my shortest poem. And when I did my first reading um, from my book at Wake Robin, which was a lovely um, uh, adult elder community here, um, there were about 40 people in this little room that we were in together and they were a wonderful audience because elders are all people who have thought about these things for the most part. and. Um, they were so present to me, it made it a wonderful experience for me, especially being new at doing this. Um, but at one point I said, would you like to hear my shortest poem? And this little old lady in the front row said, four lines. And I said, you exaggerate, it's only two. I, I was unsure about putting this in the book, but the person that um, assisted me in deciding on, on the poems that would be in it, said, absolutely. It's titled, um, Drugs. Damn that we need them and bless that we have them. A lot of truth in a few words. If anyone has anything that they want to put in the chat, anything that they would like to ask me or to explore more, please feel free to do that. Um, this is uh, this poem. This is from an experience I had actually in the hospital, and um, it was a a difficult one for me because I had my own feelings inside me about what I thought was best, and um, they were mine. I needed to own them, and I also needed not to share them. Of course, you'll see as we go along. Oh, and there's one word in here that I'd like to define for you. The word is apneic, A-P-N-E-I-C. It means someone who is short of breath. 
struggling to breathe. Care, acceptance on my part. Tiny and frail and barely a shadow of who she was, this nonagenarian's petite features are immersed deeply in somnolence. I touch her shoulder and speak her name. No response. Discolored hands tell of medical misfortune. Sleep is deep as rhythmic air passes through open orifice. I sit, touching purple hands, thinking about what she has been through. Oh no, I notice that her sheet is wet. Her intravenous is leaking. It's then that my eyes rest on a very swollen arm. Finding her nurse in the hallway, I tell of my concern. It can't be, he quickly responds. Did you touch it? He defensively questions. I simply state my request again. Will you please check her IV and turn to return to the room? Realizing his accusation, he shifts and thanks me for noticing. He arrives in the room, examines her arm and intravenous site. Another must be placed, he announces. Her family wants it, he defends. This sentence is hard for me to hear. My heart questions. Her family? What about her wishes? I remind myself that my role is presence. My reluctant mind strains for acceptance. Later, a very skilled IV nurse met with success. Puncturing the bruised tissue thin skin in this apneic 93 year old. I am feeling helpless. I remind myself that touch and expressed caring have immeasurable potential. I focus on being present. My touch and voice can tell that I care. And indeed, I do. There really are some moments that um, can be hard where values are different. Um, and in fact, um, that reminds me of a poem I would like to read next to you. And I'm hoping I can quickly put my hand on it. Um, just one second, I'll have to look it up. Um, because it was in a very similar instance where um, care was potentially going to be delivered that seemed futile and um, um, not in the best interest of the patient. Here it is. There are some key words in this for me, some words that just kind of jump out. And they have a lot of um, impact. See if you recognize them. Um, this was in the hospital and there is clearly a non-acceptance of death as a natural process. Best care possible. The residents on duty have spoken with the family their advice and guidance has been met with religion-based resistance. Decisions around the use of medications and intravenous fluids, when using the words hastening and prolonging, often are based in fear and emotion. Religion and fear can so get in the way of compassionate decisions. It's a very wise, and skilled professional that can facilitate a discussion, assisting emotional family members in understanding the tenets of compassionate end of life care. To honor an organic natural process while expressing love, giving thanks, and being fully present in the final hours of life's journey is indeed the best care possible.
think I need to say anything else about that. I'm looking at the time and I think I'm going to um, I'll read one more poem that isn't in the book. Mm -hmm. Just came across this one. I haven't seen it for a while. I wrote it two years ago. No. <laughs> what year are we in? Four years ago. <laughs> Invisible unity. I breathe with you, matching my breath to yours, my way of entering your world. Like a couple dancing who in graceful movement become unified as one, I seek to with deep compassion that holds no needs, no ego, become an invisible one accompanying you soul to soul in your gentle release from this life as we know it. Move toward the light, let go. Trust that you will be embraced forever, dear one. And that's something that we who sit with, with um, volunteers who sit with patients, sometimes that's what we do is we uh, match our breathing to their breathing, which sometimes is actually very hard to maintain, of course. Um, but for a period of time, just to um, create that um, intimacy, that, that connection, that fully being fully present um, with another. I'm just looking quickly through um, some notes I have, little tidbits I have here just to see what else uh, there is I might want to share with you before we begin to close. Um, you know, it's interesting. It, it's hard for me to express. I don't express, I can't express what I want to say about this privileged work um, in a better way than that which is already written in poetic form. Um, for some reason, I didn't, I've only learned and I still a little trouble with it to say I'm a poet, um, but um, there's something about the um, economy of words that draws me to poetry. I, um, if I were to write of my experiences um, in uh, paragraph form, I would blather on and on um, endlessly, maybe pointlessly even. Um, uh, there's just something about poetry that has drawn me and um, it's so satisfying to um, be able to express what I'm feeling and process, I'm processing what I'm doing. These poems are processing and um, they're my processing of the experience that I've had so that I can um, hold it in a more passive way and go on to the next experience that I will have um, and be uh, spirit well in the meantime um, as I go forward and learn and learn from it. Um, And I'm going to ask you just a little bit about your process because I'm wondering, you know, sometimes the experience of writing poetry is that it sort of just sort of drops, you know, it's just, it comes to mind and you have to get it down on the paper. Um, other people work with poetry in different ways. And I'm just curious about your process with poetry and how this started. Is this something that you've been doing your whole life to process your experiences or is this something that really began when you were doing vigiling or? That's certainly where I've been most successful at it. In, yeah. in, uh, in my own satisfaction. Uh, uh, my own satisfaction meter runs very high um, because of how this has worked for me uh, personally. Uh, I had no idea. I mean, I just, I was just following my intuition. And as I said um, in the poem about Benny, speaking about that, Sometimes a phrase comes to me, just mm -hmm. um, something brief. It's a one liner and I jot it down and take it home with me. Um, and often my pen starts when I take that line 
and I just go forward with that. There's no rhyming. There's no um, particular rhythm and that, I, that I'm trying to, there are no rules I'm trying to follow when I write. Um, and it's just how it comes out of me. And it's very clear to me when it's done. Um, I don't go back and edit. I don't ask anyone to read them, to um, improve them or to react to them. Um, and truly, actually, one of the things that was hard for me was um, taking them out of my journal in my own handwriting in that I explored on that page, my feelings in, in the moment, my processing, and putting them in the computer and printing them out on a piece of white paper in font. <laughs> mm -hmm. It just, it changed something uh, in my experience of uh, the intimacy I feel with what I've written. It, it was very, I got over it, but uh, it was just an interesting um, experience for me to have. I'd imagine it's such a personal, you know, it's such a personal experience to be with somebody when they're dying and to be there witnessing their experience and then to write that down and then to put it on paper with the thought that it's going to go out into the world. Um, and I'm just curious about that experience for you. Yeah, to... that thought was never there, truthfully. Right. Ever. This is my personal junior, uh, journal. I was um, quite surprised when I went through my journal um, to find I had 85 poems in it. Um, and it, it was the, the point at which I really realized that this was my form of processing mm -hmm. without even acknowledging that before. Mm. Um, it, it's satisfying for me. It does what I need to process and take care of myself. There are times in sitting vigil where I need more processing than um, a one page or a couple of pages in my journal or even a few lines in my journal. Um, and I need to do that either, I do that either with an, a vol another hospice volunteer who she shared the same experience with me, um, who was also on the team that sat with this person or a volunteer coordinator. Um, but, but of course everything is, is very confidential and we respect that. Um, but that's where I can turn if I need more processing. And it's really important for us to know ourselves well enough uh, to know when we need some assistance in processing experiences and experience that we've had that has left us either sad or, or unsure or perplexed or worn, worn. I can remember one experience I had um, and I, I wrote a poem about it and the poem says, do I still have it in me? Am I, I'm not feeling like I'm responding right here uh, that my presence isn't right that's in it and I think maybe I need to take a break um I maybe need to get away from this a little bit so um self-care is really really important and figuring out we each have our own ways there are lots of different ways be it going down and listening to your favorite train whistle as it goes by or a walk in the woods or a walk on the beach or sitting in your spiritually safe um connecting place whatever it is you know, i'm wondering I'm a, if there are people here that might ahead. have something to share of their own experience vigiling or a question about something um, i want to make sure that we have time if this is something sure. so i'm wondering if people um have a question or they want to share something at the bottom of your screen we should have something called reactions and if you click on that you should be able to click on something else that's hand raising. And the reason we asked to do that is because right now I have the spotlight on Pam. And if you do the hand raising, then I'm able to drop you down so it looks like you're having a conversation with her. And also that lets me know who's asked, who's interested in asking a question. If you're just sitting here like this, I'm not really able to see you. So if anybody does have anything they'd like to share, I'm just curious if there's people here who have done vigiling and would like to share any of their experiences. It's a quiet group. 
Quiet, okay. Time. Just um, hopefully they're still awake. Yes. But truthfully, um, my poems are a lot to hold. It they does are. induce quiet. Yes. Um, in fact, you know, I was asked to, uh, to do a reading and I would do it at a, at a luncheon. And I said, mm, I don't think that's really the time for this. These are, um, these poems are pensive and um, they can feel te very tender to people. Um, they can have triggers in them for people, for um, experience, personal experiences that they've had around death or dying. Um, so I understand quiet and, you know, when we as a population had to switch to this form of communication like Zoom. I'm so used to doing my reading, standing in front of a group, holding my book and walking back and forth and being able to see faces and facial expressions and reading the group and um, having a sense of where to go next. Um, because of that, I was really apprehensive about um, the what felt kind of sanitized to me um, experience of, of screen time sharing. And um, one of the early Zooms that I did, Susan was with you with Mission Hospice. And, you know, we were saying at the dinner table tonight, my husband was saying um, something as I was leaving the room and, and um, you know, I can't remember exactly what he said, but my, my response was, um, I never could have done this. I could could have never been with the EKR Foundation without Zoom. Right. I would have had to have traveled. Yes, I couldn't have been with Mission Hospice or Yolo Hospice or um, yeah. other programs that I've been with. Um, it wouldn't have happened. Yeah. So it's been quite a gift. Yes, it's been quite a gift, and it actually it it works out pretty well. Yeah. Um, I wish there could be more exchange, personal exchange, on a, you know, on a personal level. But um, it has worked quite well and has surprised me. And my own comfort for, with it has surprised me more than anything. Yes. And it's such a beautiful experience that we can have people from India, people from California, people from all from Canada, all in the same room together experiencing mm. this. Anne says here that... Um, Anne says here that that's so true about your poems. It brings up a lot for me. And also Deborah says this often her patients tell her that she, they are going home. Mm, yeah. Beautiful. Yes. Which is beautiful because going home for most people is a comfort. It is. They're it not is. in distress at that point in their life. Yes. I've heard many people express that. You know, there's one other thing I'd like to share. And there are two things I'd like to close with Susan, just so you okay. know, so they don't take long, but uh, I'd like to use them for our closure. Um, I had a very interesting experience. Another thing I was supposed to learn, a friend of, dear friend of mine bought a number of copies of my book because she had people in her family she wanted to give it to. And um, I, in time, got a letter, an email from her uncle Peter, who I didn't know, but he was very taken with the book and had been sitting vigil with his, I think his wife's stepmother. And so he wanted to just talk, share a little bit about what he learned from doing that. But um, he, he said, and I wish I had it in front of me, I have it taped so many different places, um, but I don't see his, just one second, because if, if they were here, I would love to read it directly. Yeah. Um, oh, I have it. He says, next time I would set up a schedule for the last two or three days so people are not exhausted. I would also ask the dying person what music or readings they'd like at a time that they no longer could communicate. This is, this is the part that I underlined with red. I know a lot of people say they do not wish to die alone, but for myself, it looks like a solo journey where no companions are invited. And he goes on. Um, 
that line was so powerful for me and really held lessons that I needed to learn. You know, the program I told you about in the hospital, No One Dies Alone. Um, I actually saw an article uh, that I printed out uh, um, that was written and the title of it is No One Should Die Alone. Ooh, let's not should on people. Um, Uncle Peter really probably will never know the impact of the lesson he taught me. Um, my value is that it seems right and good to have companionship, to have someone there witnessing one of life's most important passages. Uh, birth is always, almost always witness. Um, but that's me. And I need to remember that that's me. Because even when I was talking with one of my kids about this, they, who thinks about such things, they said, you know, I can identify with that because I feel like there's important work I need to be doing when I'm dying. And I may need to have time by myself to focus on doing that work. So it, it just opened up a whole new awareness for me and acceptance of my way isn't the necessarily the the ultimately right way for everyone good lesson that's a great lesson i remember i think i was it was before i worked at mission hospice i was at a different hospice and we had just started our no one dies alone program and we got a request from a, it was for a woman who had lived she had lived a, she was like a recluse she had lived by herself her entire life but at the end of her life, because she wasn't able to care for herself, she had to move in with her nephew and his wife. And she was there and it seemed like she wasn't really happy there. She, much, she would have liked to have been by herself, but she realized that she couldn't. So she was tolerating the situation. And her nephew's wife had a baby. And at that point, it was just too much work for them to care for a newborn and for their aunt. And so they moved her to assisted living and right away her nephew said, we need to have somebody with her all the time. And when the social worker had this conversation with me, I said, could you ask him, is that because he feels guilty that he has to move her? Or is this something that she's requesting? The social worker said, well, I think we should just send somebody out. And I recognized that they all felt so helpless in how to really support this woman. So it was a Thursday, we got people going out around the clock uh, Thursday, Thursday evening, Friday, Saturday, Sunday, Monday morning, the person, the last person left at 830. And then I was coming to work to schedule again. That woman died within 10 minutes of that volunteer leaving. <laughs> I think she waited that whole time until she could really be by herself. And mm -hmm. so I really do appreciate that, um, that some people do um, really want that time and may need that time to process what's going on. Mm -hmm. Oh. Interesting. Yes. Well, let me uh, begin to close, Susan, if that's perfect. Beautiful. I realize we are at the hour just about here. Is that okay? Yes, please. Thank you. So in the preface to my book, um, which I actually had a writer's freeze, I got the poems all together and then had a writer's freeze for months, I was not able to write whatever was supposed to be in the front of a book. I had to Google what was supposed to be in the front of a book and decide whether I was supposed to write a foreword, an introduction or a preface. It was quite an experience, but when I did finally do it, it, it came out fine. The closing paragraph says, and when I am in what feels like a long, dry spell from vigil requests, I sometimes, selfishly perhaps, yearn for the call to sit with someone who is dying. When my own life is too full and I'm feeling worn, I realize that what has been missing is the quiet of connecting with my own soul. While what I give when I sit vigil is genuine and intuitive in the moment, what I receive transforms me brings me to my silent center of peace. The opportunity to enter a room and consciously empty myself of all that is outside the room, to be fully present to the solemn and profound final moments in the lifetime of another 
is a sacred gift. So true. And I would like to read my final poem. It's the last poem in the book. And when I brought the poems to the publisher in a manuscript, I had them all in chapters and everything. And I said, I have one outlier and I'm not sure what to do with it. And she said, oh, that's an epilogue. So I Googled epilogue and found out where that was to be in my book. <laughs> this is it. Important work this dying. Important work this dying, lying in wait, existing. Sleep closed eyes or unresponsive stares. What goes on? Is it dreaming or oblivion? Does a mind chatter or does it float on the waves of immeasurable endlessness? When the time comes, will I have the courage to say, let me do this the best way I can. Let me go through my dying process in as conscious and intentional a way as is possible. I want to suck the marrow out of life, to lift high the blinds on life's windows and embrace the warmth of sunlight, absorb the beauty of the night sky. I can do it if you'll be there with me as I also face storms and clouds. Let's be to courageous together as I walk my journey to forevermore. Thank you so much, Susan, for hosting me and the EKR Foundation and my dear friend, Ken. Um, it's been wonderful to share this, this time with you. Thank you so much, so much, Pam. It's such a beautiful, um, such a beautiful evening. I was telling Pam and Ken earlier that I feel quite ill and I was not sure I'd be able to sit up straight for the hour and a half. And I feel so much more relaxed now. I feel like now I can just go and go to sleep, which is really my goal for this evening. And it's just <laughs> beautiful, calm and peaceful feeling. And I, um, I just am so grateful for you being here for us to have the opportunity for community education events to all of you who have come this evening. And I also want to just say that there will be a recording of this event coming out, I hope in the next couple of days. And I'm going to go ahead and turn off the video right now. I did put up in the chat how you are able to get a hold of Pam's book that will also be in the information that we send out via Eventbrite. So you should get an Eventbrite email that will have information about how to purchase her book and the link to the YouTube channel that we'll put this up on. So I'm about to stop recording. And I just want to thank you all for being with us tonight. And uh, Thank you on behalf of the Elizabeth Cooper Ross Foundation, myself and Pam. Thank you. Thanks to everyone.